I'm going to start by recalling back uh, as a junior high kid when um, this was late 50s, when it was all the rage to be hearing about the discovery of the double helix DNA and coding for protein synthesis from these intertwining strands of DNA. This was the biggest thing in biology that had happened probably ever in my, in, at least in my brief life at that time. Here we are, 45 years later. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> and, and I have to say that the endocannabinoid system is second to none as far as discoveries in biology and science that have come forward since that time. There's nothing that even comes close. Understanding cannabinoids and the endocannabinoid system is so unique and so powerful and so underutilized in medicine that I, th I think it's absolutely uh, criminal, really, that we're holding back on the use of cannabis medicines. So there are researchers at NIH and uh, who have been publishing uh, papers quite recently saying that modulating this endocannabinoid system basically can affect almost all disease. And they list them, and it's many, many lines of diseases that are noted that are affected by the endocannabinoid system, including cancers and so forth and so forth. You know them. And we, the docs that are out here in the field doing this, have actually realized this for decades, or at least many years. And so we're in the position of trying to see cannabis medicines really gain a, a stronger foothold by way of more research, because we really need to be able to do clinical studies in order to know what is the best thing to advise. I'm going to not take too much more time, at least at the moment here, except to say I'm an MD. I practice in Sebastopol, California. My practice is cannabis consultations. I've been doing it with an office for 15 years and unofficially for about 35 years. So. I'm glad to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Hey, uh, Jean Talleyrand, uh, also an MD, uh, and I guess a reluctant businessman. Uh, uh, I've been in this business for 11 years. Uh, started Medican. Uh, at this point, we've uh, uh, evaluated over 200,000 patients over the 11 years, we meaning a group of doctors um, who work for the company. Um, I guess the comment that I want to make is, is to remark how few people are here uh, and to remark on the discussion that happened prior regarding taxation. I know this is not a, a medical talk, but I hear a lot of, wow, we finally made it. Um, and uh, the endocannabinoid system was officially discovered in 88, 92, right? So uh, I don't know if you know science, science moves slowly. And 92 is like yesterday. So we've got so much to know about how cannabinoids work with the body or how the endocannabinoid system works itself with, with the plant, with the phytocannabinoids, or with acupuncture. Um, this is a new system, and it's not about weed anymore. It's about us. It's about how well we can get understanding the system. And so that's really, as they're considering legalization, being able to use this plan all the time, are they understanding, are our legislators, so if you can grab them and say, well, what about the endocannabinoid system? How is that going to be reflected in, in your new laws? Uh, that's really what I'm curious about. My name is Tracy Ryan. I am uh, the CEO of a nonprofit collective called Canna Kids. I originally got into the industry when my baby was diagnosed with an optic pathway glioma brain tumor. I was forced into the cannabis industry. It wasn't something that I even really knew that was happening or emerging behind the scenes. This was a time when children weren't being talked about when it came to their diagnosis. And um, when somebody first offered cannabis is an option for my then tiny little baby I told them I thought they were absolutely crazy and how in the world would I get my baby stoned when that's what I used to do in college for fun 
I am not an MD. I do consider myself a momcologist now after two and a half years of going through this industry and chemotherapy sessions and working hand in hand with now hundreds and hundreds, and hundreds of other families. Um, and through a chain of events, I was blessed to be put in touch with some incredible people that knew a lot about the medicine and the industry. Aunt Zelda that's here today um, was originally brought to us through Ricky Lake and Abby Epstein, who were doing a documentary on how cannabis kills cancer in pediatrics. And through Ricky, through Aunt Zelda's, and through um, Dr. Jeffrey Raybar and a lot of other doctors and scientists and incredible minds in the industry, my education began. Um, my husband and I are continuing to treat our child, who has now been considered a medical miracle. She was supposed to be completely blind in her left eye. The right eye was supposed to be grossly compromised, and I'm here to tell you she has perfect vision. Her tumor was... <laughs> she has the kind of brain tumor that isn't supposed to shrink with chemotherapy. It's supposed to arrest the development, and if you see minimal shrinkage at best, it's considered a huge success. And if you do see shrinkage, it's only for four to six months. Our daughter had 95% regression of her tumor. Wow. A cyst completely disappeared, wow. and um, the doctors just couldn't explain it. So um, the, other, the other cool fact about another little thing that happened with my daughter is that she suffered from nine blood transfusions, and four months before she actually stopped chemotherapy, she just stopped needing them, which is not how the human body worked, and not how and there wasn't anything the doctors could explain except for that, you know what, this, this must be the cannabis. So after realizing that this is really a medicine and this is something that really can help and cure and kill these diseases, that's how Can of Kids was born. It started as a secret group on Facebook with now over 1,200 families that um, are all treating their children holistically using cannabinoid therapy. And I recognized that there was a need in this industry for more people that had education and more voices that could speak loudly. And I can speak loudly. <laughs> that is one thing I've been gifted with, is the gift of gab. And, um, and I, I just went on a mission. And now we have several hundred patients that we treat. We are getting stories that would make the hairs on your arms crawl. Kids' tumors are shrinking when they're not supposed to. Children are, are sent into palliative care and they're given no chance to live and three months later their cancer is gone and the doctors cannot explain it. We've got children who are celebrating, <laughs> thank yeah. you. Yeah. We've got children who are celebrating 30 and 45 days now, completely seizure free since their very first dose of CBD and integrated in with some THCA in many cases. We've got PTSD patients who are off their meds, people who are taking handfuls of opiates that now just don't need them anymore because their pain is gone. Crohn's patients who are gaining weight for the first time in their lives and people with severe anti-anxiety, me being one of them, being a cancer mom, that's relieving these issues. It is a medicine. I'm here to tell you, I witness it every day. Three phone calls just yesterday from parents saying, my kid's tumor is shrinking, my child is going to live. And I am, you know, first and foremost, just honored to be up here with professionals that have been doing this way longer than I have, and I'm very excited to be a part of this industry, and I'm honored. I feel blessed to have accidentally fell, fallen into this. It's, it's been a blessing for us because we do now know why God made our child sick. Thank you. I had in part because I was very disturbed by uh, Mr. Correa's uh, legislation last year. It was awful. Uh, I sent him a letter telling him it was awful, and I got very little uh, response. Uh, you had this one gentleman sitting up here and said, well, we want to check on driving. Well, I don't know. Maybe they don't believe the Department of Transportation that says there's no increased risk from driving when you've used marijuana. Or maybe they don't believe the Food and Drug Administration that says about THC, that's what Marinol is or Dronabinol, prescription medication that was approved by the FDA in 1985, and that has the usual uh, psychoactive drug uh, warning. Warning, don't drive, operate heavy equipment, or engage in dangerous activity until you determine whether or not this interferes with that activity. Pretty good advice. I'm guessing that uh, you know, all the doctors up here and any doctors that are out there give that uh, uh, advice. Uh, you had uh, uh, the fellow from uh, Los Angeles who said, gee, maybe this stuff is useful in treating PTSD or attention deficit disorder. Well, Dr. Talleyrand has 200,000 uh, clients. I'm guessing that there's more than a couple uh, that have been treated for attention deficit disorder and post-traumatic stress disorder. And I know that Dr. Hergenrather and I have seen lots of patients, but we don't have the same patient population uh, that Medicam does. Um, why couldn't the state legislature reschedule cannabis to schedule two? 
Uh, the Iowa State Board of Pharmacy rescheduled to Schedule 5. What, what are we, dummies here? We don't understand that it does have a medical use? What are they, they don't have the courage to take on the federal government when the federal government is, you know, d demonstrably wrong? And, and how about, we've heard this thing about, well, gee, people don't know enough. We, we need to know more. I'll tell you who needs to know more. It's doctors. Do we teach it in our medical schools? I, I know they teach it a little bit at UCLA, so I can't uh, knock all of them, but there was a study that came out recently that said 13% of medical schools teach about the endocannabinoid system. Whether any of those teach about the effect that cannabis has on the endocannabinoid system, I don't know. But for my money, the endocannabinoid system is the largest neurotransmitter system in the human body. And as Dr. Hergenrather said, it's uh, useful in treating an enormous array uh, of, uh, uh, of conditions. And I have to admit my own uh, slowness to learn. I guess I'm a slow learner. I probably heard about the medical value of cannabis before anybody else in this room. And it's only because I'm older than most everybody else in this room. Um, but it was in 1959. My father, who was a pharmacist, and I were talking about alcohol prohibition. And he told me, he said, you know, in 1928, when I was a freshman at the University of Minnesota School of Pharmacy, one of our assignments was to make tincture of cannabis. And he said, and we had to be very careful because the alcohol was illegal. Wow. <laughs> and I looked up in his Remington's 1927 textbook of pharmacy, and there on page 999 and 1000, it tells you how to make tincture of cannabis, and that it's useful as an anodyne, that's an archaic word for analgesic. Analgesia is the number one reason why doctors recommend cannabis today. And it also, I think it had an archaic word for tranquilizer, like calmative. So there it was. It must have taken me 15 or 20 years before I was able to shed myself of the propaganda. It wasn't that I didn't feel that marijuana should be legalized, it was that I didn't see how a plant could be a medicine. It took me 15 years, so I'm a little bit more patient when doctors don't get it in 15 minutes. But I, I, this is not 1959 anymore. I mean, we have 20,000, 22,000 research studies on cannabis and cannabinoids that have been done in the last 20 years. I mean, if you have a doctor who doesn't understand even a little bit about cannabis, then you need to get another doctor. That doctor is not reading medical journals. I'm not talking about reading High Times. I'm talking about reading medical journals. And by the way, High Times in 1975 had a cover article on the use of cannabis as medicine, and I thought, oh, they're just pulling my leg. And a couple of years later, I thought, oh, no, Dave, you're just dumb again. You know, <laughs> somebody else is, a, is, is ahead of the curve on this. So the state legislature should mandate that the medical schools that you and I are paying good tax dollars for teach about the endocannabinoid system. And, you know, we need to uh, uh, have regulations that protect people. We need to treat this like a medicine. It should be tested, absolutely. You got THC in this, you got CBD in this, you got CBG in this, what terpenes do you have in this? What's the dose that you're taking? Oh, and you know, it'd be nice if the people read the label. Some of you may be familiar with Maureen Dowd, who is a columnist for the New York Times, went to Colorado, and uh, she had a candy bar, and she took a piece of that. Nothing happened because when you take something orally, it takes 45 minutes to an hour and 15 minutes. So she took another piece. Of course, nothing happened. She waited another 15 minutes. She ate the whole thing. Oh, man. And she wrote this column. I was miserable for six hours. <laughs> well, maybe if she'd have done some research uh, you know, and read up on it, uh, that would have been useful. And I think that these things need to be labeled. I got a whole bunch of other stuff I want to share with you, but I think I'll leave a little air for the rest of the uh, uh, panel here. Oh, there is, you know, even Time Magazine, you know, comes out with the highly divisive, curiously underfunded, and strangely promising world of pot science. And I do want to mention these guys want to see whether cannabis interferes with driving. I have a 100-page uh, response in a legal case that I put together with Paul Armontano. Paul is the deputy director of Normal, knows more about driving under the influence of marijuana than anybody. 
I get the big gigs because I have MD after my name, not because I know something about this. And it, we've got the information, we've got the data there. How about spending this money on seeing whether or not cannabis cures cancer? Thanks. So every panelist here has seen some amazing things with cannabis, and as Dr. Beerman just mentioned, there are over 20,000 peer-reviewed studies in formal medical journals about the use of cannabis or cannabinoids and their efficacy against many conditions. And I was wondering what several of you thought um, some of the most informative and influential articles were that showed how and why cannabinoids were benefiting, benefiting these diseases, either studies specifically on uh, specific conditions or the endocannabinoid system as a whole? Because there's a lot of great ones out there. I'd love to know what you think. I can start. Um, this is actually more of a patient doctor anecdotal study that United Patients Group posted recently that I found extremely intriguing and I have incorporated into our practice, which is how THC and CBD works with different forms of breast cancer because there's um, estrogen pro positive, progesterone positive, HER2. And we have found this to be true in our practice with our breast cancer patients, as have the nurses that I've worked with. And it was interesting to find that if you are um, estrogen positive or triple positive, the THC can actually influence the growth of the cancer cells, whereas if you do a higher CBD regimen, you see the cancer just get annihilated. And I found that very interesting because we all believe THC is a cancer killer. And in every kind of disease outside of estrogen positive and triple positive, it is. We are, our, our average ratio is a one to one or a two to one, and in some cases even a three to four to one being THC the highest. But I found this very intriguing, which is you know, one of the reasons why I think that the science, the, the, the trials, like these things have to be happening now, and we have to get this off the schedule in order to really be able to study how the human body interacts with these different <coughs> compounds once we introduce them into our body. We've had some incredible success with breast cancer, and, and by following this anecdotal, doctor-driven, patient-driven um, type of regimen, we're seeing it really work in these patients, and I just, I found that so interesting when you know, looking at all of the other studies out there, and, and that was the one study that really kind of made us pivot a little bit on how we were treating these women individually. I would like to... It's actually, it's, uh, if you go to unitedpatientsgroup.com, they have it on there, and we also have it on uh, rylandfarms.com. If you go under our cannabis studies, it's on the first page. We have summarized their article and put a link to the full article on there, and it's, it's been driven by anecdotal and doctor research. Dr. I was, wanted to make the comment that, I, and I don't have the name of the author, but there was a study come out of Israel in May, and it was speaking about the difference between isolated CBD and CBD as a whole plant extract. Just a quick show of hands, who knows about this already? Okay, about a quarter of you. I'm going to just briefly describe it. When you take a single molecule CBD and look at the dose response, it's a bell-shaped curve, which is to say, too little and it doesn't do a thing, too much and it doesn't do a thing, but just in the right sweet spot, it does a lot. So this is something unique in, in CBD. Uh, well, it is unique, but there are, are, are uh, what I want to compare, what they compared it to in the Israeli study is this. They took a whole plant extract of a CBD rich medicine and it behaved as a linear curve. So the more you gave, the more effect you got. This is what we have in the plant. And so when you isolate these molecules and get out to these 99% CBD uh, extracts, that's not what you want. You want the whole plant. Now, I'm gonna move quickly on to three papers that I think are valuable to, for you to know about. One of them is the Hustis paper. Marilyn Hustis was published in 2007 on pharmacokinetics of cannabis. And this is something that is a little out of date, but it's the only thing we have right now. And it talks about bioavailability and the blood levels and so forth uh, of various forms of administration of, um, of cannabis. So what we're looking at is the differences between the metabolism of ingested forms, oral buccal exposure, rectal uh, use of cannabinoids. Uh, you know, she goes through the whole list. So it's the best information we have to date. And I think it's something that you ought to have in your, in your folder of uh, cannabis information. Another one is called the Keel study that came out of England. It was published in about 2005 or six 
What they did in England, this is about schizophrenia and psychosis, and there's still quite a push by the federal government to make you feel that uh, we're gonna cause a lot of uh, schizophrenia and psychosis by letting cannabis be legalized. This study went on to look at about two and a half percent of the, of the English population over a 10 year span in the clinic systems in Great Britain. And over that span, the 18 year olds or younger had an 18 fold increase in the use of cannabis. And during that interval, there was no increase in schizophrenia or psychosis. It's an important study to be able to refer to. And the third one I'm, I'm gonna mention for a moment here is in 2010, the paper by Marku and McAllister and others came out of San Francisco. This is a very important study in order to look at the effects of CBD and THC on the growth of cancer cells and, and what happens when you put these two molecules together, which is known as synergism. And it's quite remarkable because as they increase the doses of THC, they began to see the cells either die off or not be able to grow, both with THC at a certain level in the micro, five micromolar range, and in the one micromolar range when you give CBD, similarly they had a drop in the, in the survival of these cells. When they put them together, the cancer cells practically could not grow at all. So very important when you're dealing with cancers, get the, ca get the cannabinoids balanced more or less. Exactly what balance? We don't know. We would love to know, and we'd love to be able to look at some, some clinical trials where we could tease this apart more. I, taking off from... <laughs> taking off from uh, what Jeff had to say, when I saw Justin's uh, questions, my response was, we don't know. The federal government has systematically blocked research yet they deny it. As a matter of fact, I recently wrote an op-ed piece that was published in the Seattle Times and they denied it there. Their response was, oh, we approve uh, research for THC and CBD. As you just heard Dr. Hergenrather say, we're not talking about isolated uh, extracts, we're talking about the whole plant. Um, Dr. Donald Tashkin is an emeritus professor of pulmonology at UCLA. Uh, there was an old study he did in 1975 that said, cannabis is a bronchodilator. And this is why in the 1920s, you had at least three cigarettes on the market uh, that were contained cannabis and they were for the treatment of asthma. Because it's like Advair, it's a bronchodilator and it's an anti-inflammatory. Tashkin is more famous in a, a, an article that you definitely should have, uh, was his study in Los Angeles where he took a look at the uh, Los, Los Angeles County uh, can, uh, cancer uh, uh, research uh, directory or blog and uh, had 1,100 uh, patients, uh, matched them up with 1,100 people of similar age, sex, and uh, geographic area. And he thought that he was going to find that the more marijuana you smoked, the more likely you were to get lung cancer. And he's a very straight shooter. And what he found was the more marijuana you smoked, the less likely you were to get lung cancer. <laughs> uh, and, and, I mean, and this guy was a, a straight shooter. He, I, he, I, I, he has a a great deal of respect for me. Uh, two more quick ones. Uh, one is not a sci uh, scientific study, it's a clinical study, and it was done by Dr. Hergenrather on Crohn's disease. Uh, and it was a very extensive questionnaire, and it showed that uh, people with Crohn's disease who were using cannabis, this is you know, sort of a skewed study, uh, for treating their Crohn's disease, had less abdominal pain, fewer stools, better form stools, uh, and uh, many of them uh, were able to stop using steroids, which is not a good thing to use on a daily basis, unless maybe you have Crohn's disease. Uh, and then uh, two more quick ones. One is an article that appeared in the Scientific American in 2004 by Elger and Nickel, uh, entitled The Brain's Own Marijuana, and it talks about the retrograde inhibition, which I think is very important in understanding uh, the role of cannabis in terms of uh, dealing with uh, migraines or seizures uh, and uh, attention deficit disorder and post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, and then lastly, there was a review article in 2008 out of the University of Wisconsin that touched on about 12 or 15 different cancers uh, in which it, m numerous studies found that uh, Cannabis uh, killed cancer cells in tissue culture and in mice. Uh, one more article if you're writing it down. 
the care and feeding of the endocannabinoid system, highly recommended. It's a review article, and it uh, brings to light that this is not about the plant, it's about the endocannabinoid system. Excellent. And yes, that article that um, Dr. Talleyrand just mentioned talks about all these other things that you can do to enhance your endocannabinoid system, like acupuncture, probiotics, omega-3s. So there's many things that you can do besides using cannabis in order to strengthen your endocannabinoid system and make the cannabis that you do use a lot more effective. And I did want to throw in one more study that's really great. It's called the Endocannabinoid System as an Emerging Target of Pharmacotherapy, which was published in 2006. It literally goes through how the endocannabinoid system plays a role in every single major disease. Um, so, you know, any, any relationship, it's, it's pretty incredible. Um, the Endocannabinoid System as an Emerging Target of Pharmacotherapy by Patcher, Botkai, and Kunos. Um, so, great article. So although we, you know, there, we do need a lot more research, especially to make good recommendations to patients about what to use, but you know, in the current environment, what can you do to make good recommendations to patients and what are the most important factors in making those recommendations? You guys want to go? You to go. <laughs> <laughs> I'll always talk first. <laughs> what, the, what the most important factors are in recommending a cannabis protocol for someone and how you go about making your recommendations about what they should use and do. Well, for us, I'm not a doctor. I didn't go to medical school. I don't understand drug interactions like these professionals do. So we have a team of nurses and, and doctors that we're training currently that can really look at what is the disease? What are they doing from a Western medicine type of standpoint? How old are they? How much do they weigh? And how do we need to treat this patient based on their specific disease? One of the most frustrating things for me is this a gram a day. It's just not how you should be treating yourself when you have a serious disease. A gram of what? No two oils are the same. One oil could be 40% in strength. One oil could be 75 to 85% in strength. So telling a patient, go take a gram a day, that'll fix your cancer, it's, it's not how it should be done. We're, we're more advanced than that now. Um, the other thing that kind of frust frustrates me still a little bit is this grain of rice theory, the half a grain of rice, the grain of rice. Well, it, it, a half a grain of rice to you isn't a half a grain of rice to me. Yeah, is, is, it, is it a long grain, is it a short grain, is it, you know, what, what size is this grain? So, you know, what we have done is we've really taken a step back and said, okay, how do we treat these patients consistently across the board, especially because we deal so heavily in pediatrics. The last thing you want to do is send a child into, you know, anxiety attack or make them uncomfortable or any, in any way or make them feel worse than they already feel. So we start our patients out with tinctures and we look at how many cannabinoids per milliliter are in that tincture and we start them off on a small dose as small as five milligrams. And using a tincture, we can accurately weigh out using a one gram syringe that exact dose every single time. And then we slowly increase them every three to five days. Now this is all specific to that disease. We don't treat an autistic child the same way as we do an epileptic child or the same way do, we do as a cancer child or an adult with cancer or Crohn's or PTSD. All of these different types of disease have different things that anecdotally, because we're not allowed to do a lot of this research, have found to be the most effective. So it's about working with a professional that understands exactly what pharmaceuticals are being ingested into the body, how those interact with the liver enzymes and the body as a whole, um, and what kind of, like epilepsy for example, a lot of these like onfi and horrible drugs that they put these children on can, can block the cannabis and can interact with the cannabis in a very negative way. So for an epilepsy patient, it really is quite important to have their physician on board so that you can start to decrease the use of those pharmaceuticals while you're increasing the use of cannabis in order to make it actually work. Otherwise, the kid's just gonna continue to seize. And then also understanding the power of bringing in something like THCA, which is an incredible medicine that we're doing more and more research on and more and more studies on. When it comes to our, our epileptic children, we're finding that in, in many cases, the CBD does a fantastic job of decreasing the seizures, but it's not completely getting rid of them. You add in a little bit of THCA, our kids are seizure free. We've got three of them right now celebrating 30, 45, 55 days without a single seizure after having seizures every hour on the hour and some hundreds a day. 
So it's really understanding each of the diseases. Um, you know, when you have a GBM, for example, if it's been completely resected and there's no tumor still there, then the protocol could definitely be different than someone that still has a mass in their brain and, and the cancer is still there and active. It requires a higher THC versus when there's no tumor present, in a lot of, a lot of circumstances, a higher CBD. With children like my little girl, Sophie, who has an optic pathway glioma, we have so far seen a 100% success rate in getting these tumors that don't traditionally shrink to shrink using a protocol of a one-to-one, -one, and in some cases a two-to-one, and we're starting them around the 350 milligrams of total cannabinoids a day, monitoring the scans, seeing if it works, and keeping them there at the lower dose versus the 500, 600, 700 milligrams a day for a small child, because why give them more medicine if they don't actually need it? The challenge that we have with cancer is that these kids aren't getting scans every few weeks. They're getting scans every two and a half months. So we're really having to stick with the protocol for a certain amount of time, seeing how it works, adjust, and then continue the treatment. But understanding the science of it and what their oncologists are doing or their neurosurgeons are doing or neurologists are doing is very, very important when also introducing cannabinoid therapy into the body. Um, we adjust doses uh, depending on per patient. So even with blood pressure medicine, uh, you're going to give start at a dose and then you're going to adjust it over time. Uh, and one person might react well to 10 milligrams of lisinopril and one person might not react well at all. So there's still variability from person to person. But the dosing, how do we dose in medicine? Uh, it's very simple, milligrams per kilogram of body weight. So milligrams of what are you using? THC, CBD, uh, beta caryophylline. What are you using? What's in the plant that you're using? Have your medicine analyzed. Then you'll know how many milligrams you're taking on a regular basis and how, what's your body weight? Because a big person may metabolize differently than a smaller person, especially important in the kids. Uh, so really simple things, understand variability from person to person, and we're trying to standardize with milligrams per kilogram. I would add to that to say that uh, somewhere in this range of a half a milligram per kilogram per day is a, a decent starting point for many situations. And I would also add that tailoring the dose for any individual is, is what it's all about. And when I hear Justin's question, I'm kind of thinking, how much time do we have? <laughs> this is what I do initially, uh, certainly at the first visit and follow-up visits as well, because it's an awful lot of it is about figuring out what's going on with this person and how, how they need to best utilize the medicine. So for example, if it's an adult who's picking up the grandkids at three o'clock at school, that's gonna play into the treatment plan as far as what kind of shape they're gonna be in after, after they're dosing. So many times we're going to dose a higher dose at bedtime for serious medical conditions. Uh, often we're going to try to get two or three doses in per day. This is orally I'm speaking of because of the fact that orally ingested cannabinoid oils or tinctures of any kind or products of any kind have a, a metabolism over the course of about five to ten hours generally. And we do have genetic variations, not only in our genome to code for this cytochrome P450 metabolic pathway, not everybody is the same. And in many people, it's quite different. So we really have to look at an individual's response in order to know what kind of a dose they can tolerate. Another factor that was kind of alluded to was drug-drug interactions. And this is a, a, a big deal, but not a big deal. It's a big deal because uh, well, it's a not a big deal because over the use of Sativex coming out of uh, Great Britain, a one-to-one -one ratio of THC and CBD, roughly a couple of milligrams of each in an oral spray, they have then had these patients using the Sativex sprayed orally five, ten times a day is more or less what they're using it. In 30,000 patient years, and Dr. Russo, who is the medical director there, said it's probably more like 40,000 patient years of experience, there have been no discontinuation of drugs of the, of the Sativex because of a drug-drug interaction. That is to say, even though some, uh, some pharmaceuticals, such as anticonvulsants, a couple different anticonvulsants, are metabolized by the same metabolic pathway as the THC and CBD, 
it's not a worry because probably the dose of cannabinoids is small enough to where it does not have a significant impact in altering the blood levels of these anticonvulsants. Now, on the other hand, a kid that might be on anticonvulsants, that's the kid who you really have to be careful with because a, you could run into a drug-drug interaction and, and the, the quantity of, of uh, or the concentration of the, the anticonvulsant may change significantly if they're on a very high dose of cannabis oils, such as in a cancer therapy, which in a kid with a brain tumor, they may very well be on an anticonvulsant as well. But accepting that, it just generally isn't a problem. Um, I, I think I go back to the question that I asked in one of the previous uh, panels, is we need to treat cannabis like a medicine, and that's what Dr. Talleyrand and, and Dr. Hergen Rather have said. Uh, there is uh, an individual adjustment that you make with most patients on most medicines, so why should it be any different for, for cannabis? I also need to admit my ignorance. Here's a, a wheel that shows CBD, CBN, CBC. I really don't have a clue as to what the, the appropriate uh, amount, uh, percentages of them. That's why we need to have more research. Now, uh, GW Pharmaceuticals is doing some of that research, but that's just uh, the tip of the iceberg. Now, what I have used in terms of determining dose is uh, dronabinol, uh, which is THC. I mentioned that um, before. And what I found is, is that relatively low doses of THC, like two and a half milligrams, one to three times a day, is good for most people who have attention deficit disorder or who have anxiety. Five to 10 milligrams of THC is uh, good for uh, helping people sleep. I had uh, treated a woman who had multiple sclerosis and then she fell and tripped and uh, fractured her uh, shoulder. And she said, Doc, the 10 milligrams didn't do anything, uh, but when I went to 15 milligrams, it got rid of the pain. So then I started prescribing 15 to 20 milligrams, and what I found was I got a lot of complaints about the side effects, about dysphoria. Uh, and you, you need to be careful of that, and that's, that's why the whole plant, as was mentioned earlier, uh, is, uh, is, is so important. I had a patient that came in about two, three weeks ago, uh, and uh, he had, uh, I believe he had pain. And so they took an edible, and I said, now try to get a one-to-one -one THC to CBD. So they did. And I get a call and said, the guy hallucinated. Well, how much did he take? 30 milligrams. And, and then I said, listen to yourself, Dave, is, CBD partially blocks the euphoria caused by THC. And I don't know what that partially blocks means, but let's say for a minute that it blocks 30% of the euphoria. So this guy had the equivalent of 20 milligrams of THC. I can understand why for some people uh, it would be unpleasant and cause dysphoria. So you, you, know, you need to take a look at the side effect profile. You need to take a look at uh, uh, prescription drugs in which there are recommended doses and they've tested it on animals and people. And you need to listen to your patients. I mean, and, and everybody's different and I've learned more from my patients than I can uh, possibly thank them for. Absolutely. Excellent. A little follow-up? Yes, of course. I wanted to um, r recognize that what Tracy Ryan had said a minute ago uh, regarding not oil, not all oils are the same. This is something that you, I become very aware of in, in consulting with people by phone across the country. For example, a fellow uh, said, gee, I took the oil and you know, increased the dose and I'm still not feeling it. And so they finally, on advice, went ahead and had it analyzed and the amount of cannabinoids in the oil was something around 12%. Uh, that's not what we get out here, generally speaking. So when you get these oils that are 30 to 85% cannabinoids, you've got something much more potent. Another uh, element of this is how much CBD is in there. And the more CBD, it really offsets the psychoactivity significantly. And one of my patients brought back to me some follow-up about treating cancer, a uh, poorly treated uh, myeloma, multiple myeloma patient. And I sent him home in recommending that he up, you know, increase his dose gradually over the course of a few weeks. And when he came back, he said, well, I got home and said, phooey. And he took the whole gram of oil just at, at one time and was um, 
pretty, pretty knocked out, and he and his wife kind of chuckled, and he said, yeah, you were kind of a lump on the couch for five days. <laughs> he, he continued to take the gram of oil a day, by the way. He was determined, so he kept taking it. On the fifth day, he got up and started acting normally again. The point is, tolerance is our friend in this situation. It really develops rapidly when we use high doses of cannabinoids. And it may not be five days for everybody, but generally over that course of about a week, you see a great deal of tolerance developed. And people should you know, be cautioned about a variety of things, including a fall risk, and it's going to maybe affect their blood pressure and so, so forth when they're using high doses of oil, but eventually they're gonna to become tolerant of it and be able to take high doses, which may be necessary in some conditions, particularly some really difficult tumors. Uh, my concern, Jeff, is, is down-regulating the system, the endocannabinoid system. If you take too much, like Rick, Rick Simpson oil procedure, maybe you're doing harm because you're down-regulating your system. Mm -hmm. So what's the sweet spot? You know, uh, we definitely have to be aware of that. Yeah, and I agree with that completely because I, I've got patients that come to me and they're like, we're on 2,000 milligrams. I'm like, are you crazy? Why would you ever take 2,000 milligrams? But some of these kids have diseases like DIPG, which is in the brainstem, where there's hardly any receptors at all. And with cannabis, we're not seeing shrinkage in the brainstem, we're seeing stabilization. So they're thinking if I just keep giving more, 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 maybe at some point, I'm gonna to start to see some shrinkage, but there are just some situations, and this is one individualized situation mm -hmm. where we're seeing stabilization and not you know, apoptosis or, or cell death. Um, so it's really about finding that sweet spot. And, and you know, like Dr. Bierman said, listening to your patients or listening to your body if, it, if you are the patient and working up slowly. We, we usually um, advise our patients to go up and dose every three to five days or once that psychoactivity starts to kind of mitigate itself so that they can build that tolerance easily. And the, the mass majority, say 90, 97, 98 percent of our kids get to a point where they don't feel it at all anymore. Mm -hmm. my, my child's going to be three next weekend, and you would never know that she is on cannabis at all. She is wild. So, <laughs> which is a great thing considering she's on chemotherapy. Like she's a normal, happy, healthy, functioning, chubby little baby, and, <laughs> and she loves life, and she's kicking the shit out of cancer, pardon my French. <laughs> no need to apologize for that. <laughs> My question is, um, I guess the, not sure what the proper word is, um, cannabis potentiating the effects of chemo, possibly, and sort of how that works, if maybe asking your doctors for um, a trial dose, or I get fully aware cannabis helps throughout, through chemo, but are there instances where um, maybe cannabis allows the chemo to work more, I guess. That's my question. Absolutely. <laughs> synergistic. Yeah. There is a synergistic effect with tol uh, temozolomide, one of the right. cancer drugs, yep. and uh, cannabinoids. That's been seen in a study that's out there. Uh, it's not uncommon for glioblastoma and other that's exactly what I'm talking about. conditions yep. where over a course of a few months, the, the effect of temozolomide is wanes. So it looks like it's helpful initially, and then it disappears. If cannabinoids are brought in, at least in this study that it was published uh, not too long ago, temozolomide seemed to regain its edge as the cannabinoids were added. So there is a synergism with, uh, with the cannabinoids and the, and the chemotherapy. As far as the chemotherapy in general, I don't think there's much question that the docs out there, even the square docs that have never done this before, are recognizing that here the cannabis patients are coming in and they've gained weight during chemotherapy and they're feeling great. And in many cases, it really mitigates the symptoms significantly. Absolutely. My daughter's on Temidar right now. So she's on Temidar and Vincristine and Carboplatin. And again, this is where I always go back to these optic pathway gliomas. And this is one of the reasons why I want to do everything in my power to raise money to do a trial that's, that's privately funded on these specific tumors, because these are tumors that the doctors told us, this is not going to shrink. Your kid's going to go blind. Chemo's not going to make it smaller. Um, it's going to arrest the development of it. If we see a little bit of shrinkage, it'll be considered a huge success. 95% shrinkage, you, yes, the chemo is working with the cannabis in this situation. And all of her doctors are now, again, doctors who had no idea that cannabis was even in the medical books or had even been talked about. They had no research on it whatsoever, like Dr. Bierman was saying before. They know now. And now 
all of these other children that have these low-grade gliomas that don't traditionally work with chemotherapy, these tumors are shrinking like crazy. I've got one dad who contacted me yesterday, another scan, same, same type of tumor, OPG, tumor is shrinking even more. The radiologist actually called the oncologist and said, what new clinical trial do you have this little girl on where you're getting her tumor to shrink this much? And the doctor's like, she's, she's on vincristine and carboplatin. And the radiologist's like, I can't explain this. I can't understand how it continues to keep shrinking month after month after month. So absolutely, it, it absolutely uh, um, makes the chemo work harder and stronger and penetrates those cells deeper to, to cause more cell death. I've got a story to share with you. I was at a cocktail party in February, and this uh, fellow who's in late 20s, early 30s said, my stepfather has uh, cancer of the throat to metastasize to the regional lymph node, the rib, and the liver, and the doctors say he's going to die. What do you know about Simpson oil? Well, I don't know too much about Simpson oil. And Dr. Ergenrath there really knows about that. But I told him what little I knew. And, didn't think much of it. In early June, he calls me up and said, uh, last CAT scan showed my stepfather is cured. And he came into my office a couple weeks later. And uh, uh, yeah, they, said we, they couldn't find any. They did an, another CAT scan and found a little bit of cancer at the base of his tongue. Oh, they did give him chemo along with the, this. And so now they're going to give him chemo, but not for palliation. They're going to give him treatment for cure. Uh, and so, I, the problem goes back to what I think all of us have touched on is you need to have some research to really answer this question. On the other hand, Dr. Abrams has nailed it when he said there's more than enough basic science evidence and anecdotal reports to justify doing double-blind studies. And everybody in this room should write the White House and say, when are you going to start the double-blind studies that are federally funded for the treatment of cancer? Excellent. The only known uh, injection I am aware of is Manuel Guzman infusing THC into, into the GBM brain tumors in, in uh, Madrid. And otherwise, I am not aware of anybody injecting cannabis oil into tumors. Uh, on the other hand, when you, when you talk about uh, breast cancer, uh, Dr. McAllister uh, up in San Francisco is doing a double-blind study with cannabis for treatment of breast cancer, and I think all of us uh, up here are aware of breast cancer patients uh, whose cancer has either gone into remission or be cured, depending upon you know what terminology you want to use, from uh, oral uh, ingestion. Uh, it's speculative as to whether injecting it would be worthwhile, but uh, it's certainly something that would be uh, worth doing research on. What uh, McAllister previously did a study on mice, uh, and I think they injected uh, 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 the material, whatever their, their uh, subject material was, I, I don't know if it was from cannabis or THC or CBD, into the peritoneal cavity, and uh, it cured the mouse's breast cancer. They didn't inject it into, into the tumor, they injected it into the mouse. So we know that you're, we can cure your mouse's breast cancer. <laughs> curious about the, the uh, resistance among physicians to uh, accepting that, it, uh, that medical marijuana is a fact of life and whether you think that uh, perhaps one cause is this persistent belief that it is either a gateway drug to addiction or addictive itself and also the prevalence of, uh, of addiction programs and therapists who combine it with, all, with opiates and uh, alcohol addiction and all of those and, and, and what the solution that is, whether that is an obstacle to greater acceptance of it, and is that then, a, a, is the solution to that the education of physicians and uh, peer pressure to get past that? I think that's a biggest part of it would be education. The other part of it is to stop the federal government wasting money on, on vilifying and misleading the public about what's going on. 
that's ONDCP, that's FDA, that's NIH, that's NI NIDA, and FDA are all involved. FDA probably the least, but they're all involved in, in the misinformation that continues to come out in order to protect the vested but interests. You see that among your peer I see that among my colleagues, but I'm also, it, the demographic of all of this is changing. Those docs that never referred a patient before and I hadn't heard from them for 20 years <laughs> are now sending patients over. A local oncologist who had never seen a result with cannabis saw a GBM disappear. So things are happening and they're, you know, we're at the oh, whoa stage with some of these docs and it's really nice to be able to see this. But as long as the feds are vilifying it, the majority of doctors are not gonna feel comfortable getting involved in this. We do have to work on both the education, medical school side of it. We can't legislate medical schools teaching cannabinoid medicine. We, that's what I'm told by the legislators in my question today. So we have to put pay, pressure on every medical school in the, in the land. That's been, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no. That's been my experience with the doctors that I've worked with and that our patients have been with is that, you know, you go in initially and they have no idea what you're talking about and then they see something miraculous happen and they start to go, hmm, you know what, maybe, maybe there is something to this. And my daughter's been treated at Kaiser Sunset. She's now at CHOA. Um, we've collaborated with doctors at Chalk Hospital and none of these people really understood what was going on with her and her case and many of our other kids' cases that are also treated at these same hospitals, but they started to see this this spontaneous regression, if you will, in a tumor that clearly wasn't spontaneous, spontaneously regressing. And more and more oncologists now are sending us patients. We're working with five major hospitals right now, um, holistic doctors, acupuncturists. They're, they're seeing the miracles and they cannot, they can't deny it. We had a, a boy 16 years old with uh, relapsed osteosarcoma. He had 22 tumors in his bones came in in a neck brace, he was on Percocet, Oxycontin, and Vicodin every day just to get out of bed. And they had him on a palliative chemo only to help with pain. I'm here to tell you within two weeks on our cannabis oil, he was completely pharmaceutical free and within 90 days he was cancer free. And that doctor has now said, thank you. That doctor has now said, I'm a believer, I wanna start sending you patients and if, if AJ is still cancer free in the next Two months when he gets his next th next scan, I'm going to work with Dr. Ronnie Goldstein, and we're going to publish this to the medical journals. So it's happening. Yeah, I I think that you're you're going to see, uh, um, as we have younger doctors who at least are familiar with the recreational use of cannabis, a greater willingness to read about this and to accept what they read. I had a uh, orthopedic surgeon write me a letter, and I. The, the papers in Santa Barbara, the weekly is very liberal, and the daily is a libertarian thing, and so they both love what I write. Uh, and uh, he said, why don't you talk about the side effects of marijuana in your op-ed pieces? I said, because there's only 800 words that they allow me here, but if you, you think I don't know anything about it, I sent him a chapter from my book. Oh, he also carbon copied the paper because he thought he was being so clever. And I carbon copied the paper too because I knew I was being clever. Uh, and uh, they didn't publish his uh, his uh, his letter. Uh, I think the more you have doctors like uh, like Dr. Hergenrather and myself who are willing to speak out and stick our necks out, you begin to have people in the community who know us and say, well, they're not nuts on other things. Maybe they really know what they're talking about, you know, and, and you begin to see these changes. But, you know, I mean, it takes years and years. And one of the other things I noticed in Santa Barbara is that there have been two or three presentations uh, at the local hospital, uh, one, two of them by a couple of residents and the other by the doctor who's second in charge of uh, continuing education. And that's what you need to do. I mean, we, we're getting to have more certification for Category 1 CME. And I, I think one of the most effective things for getting doctors to uh, recognize this is what Tracy has talked about, is the patient telling the doctor, this stuff works. This stuff works. And I should mention there's, there's a uh, online program that uh, um, Deborah Malka uh, worked on, and I provided a little assistance uh, through the, uh, uh, what's it called, Cannabis Institute of Medicine. And it's, it's 12 one-hour continuing CME things. Or you can give your doctor a present of my book. Yeah.
<laughs> I, can, 